Welcome to BFR Radio, a podcast dedicated to all things BFR. This podcast is proudly sponsored by sportsrehab.com.au, where if you want to buy your own BFR cuffs or you want more information about the type of training or you just want more information, this is your one place to go. And I'm your host, Chris Gavilio. Hi everyone and welcome back to BFR Radio. Thanks for joining in and I hope that your training or your coaching is going well. Before I head into today's article review, a quick reminder that if you're looking for practical ideas on how to implement BFR into your own training, check out my Instagram, which is at Chris Gavilio, or my YouTube channel, which is Sports Rehab Oz, that's A-U-S, short for Australia. If you follow me on social media, I've also been trialing a few different things. The first one is 60 Second Snippets, which is 60 seconds of the best bits of the podcast, as well as Instagram text image posts, which quotes. Which one do you prefer? My gut feel is the quotes seem to be going a little bit better than the 60 second snippets, which is just me talking and the subtitles underneath. So you could look at that with the volume down. And also, if you are enjoying the podcast, please give it a rating on iTunes. I'd really appreciate that. As you probably noticed, it's actually been a while since my last podcast, and I thank you for your patience. And I have had lots of people reach out to me saying how much they value my podcast and what I've been able to value add in the world of BFR. Now, the reason why I've been a little bit slack is I've actually had a few presentations recently, and one was for the Australian Strength and Conditioning Coaches Association Conference. This year, it was an online-style conference due to the whole COVID scenario. In my presentation, I spoke about how I periodize strength training utilizing a myriad of different concepts. So yes, it was actually more about strength training and performance than it was about BFR. So it actually shows you what I do in most of my day-to-day job. This study was actually a case study of one of the decathletes that I coached for the Tokyo Olympics who actually won a bronze medal. And that's called the Bulos Paradox. So if you're an ACA member, you can get a hold of that and it's only available if you registered for the conference. So I'm not allowed to release that to the general public. So quite an interesting spin on how to put all the different training concepts such as isometric, eccentric, triphasic training, and a little bit of BFR and put that together for an elite athlete. I've also had a work change as well. So I've been navigating that and that's taken a lot of my time. One of the positives is that I'm actually spending more time putting together some other strength and conditioning and BFR concepts that I've actually been wanting to do for quite some time. In particular, one of the things that I'm doing, I'm actually providing an online strength and conditioning service, which means that if you've been thinking about improving your own training, I can actually provide this for you. I use Train Heroic as the platform app that I put programs onto, and I provide anything from one-on-one through to online consults. So if you're living overseas outside of Australia, and you want the same level of service that I give some of the Olympians, except that face-to-face coaching. We can use Zoom, we can use videos, and obviously use that online platform. So I can actually help you with your training there. And with respect to that, just contact me through my socials or the contact us on my website, which is sportsrehab.com.au. I also have some big plans for BFR specifically, so stay tuned for that as well. The last few episodes included a short series of papers which reviewed different sports specifics training with BFR and coincided with the Olympics and Paralympics and highlighted potential direct benefits to sports performance. For me, and hopefully for you, it showed that BFR can be used for more than just strength training and stationary cardiovascular base training. For today's episode, I'm going to change it up and it's time for a Your Questions Answered segment. Interestingly, I got three independent emails on a very similar subject within the last month. Therefore, I thought it was actually quite relevant to put it into this podcast form. In particular, it is on the subject of using BFR with youth athletes. Hopefully, this is not too controversial. And actually, to be honest, when I was putting together, perhaps a little bit nervous because there is very little literature on BFR and youth athletes, and there's actually no position statement out there. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use as much information as I can and my own experience in this space to hopefully give you a really good solid answer. To give you some context behind this episode, the first question was from a physiotherapist who is involved in the training of elite artistic gymnasts aged between 10 to 26 years of age. 
Their common injuries include growth-related injuries such as osgrus slatus and tendinopathy injuries, especially of the Achilles tendons, as well as bony stress injuries of the foot, shin, and back. As a side note, in previous podcasts, I've actually alluded to BFR being a great tool for tendon pain as well as recovering from bone stress injuries, and such could BFR be used in this specific population. The second question was from another physiotherapist who works with dancers, and in particular young dancers around pretty much the same age. And they wanted to know the youngest age I'd use BFR training with, and are there any contraindications for use in those under 18 years of age? So how to best answer this question? As I mentioned, unfortunately, there isn't any position statement with respect to BFR and youth, from what I know of. There's actually very little out there, but I will piece this together to give you a balanced answer and perhaps rather my opinion. And to answer this question, I'm going to break this into three parts. Firstly, I want to briefly discuss the idea of strength training in youth in general, that is without BFR at all. Secondly, I'll highlight a few studies in younger age groups and then finish up with my own view and personal experiences. Firstly, let's look at the evidence and concept of strength training of the youth. There was a fantastic thread on Twitter recently citing a few papers on this. And to add to this, the Australian Strength and Conditioning Association, the ASCA, have their own position stand on this. And I'll put a link to the notes in case you want to directly download the PDF file. The ACA is Australia's peak industry body for accrediting strength and conditioning coaches and aims to ensure and enhance quality assured strength and conditioning coaches. I'm an ASCA coach and I'm also a supporter of what they stand for. In fact, this is a requirement of most SNC coaches in Australia. So it's important in my opinion to ensure that whichever SNC coach that you do use or an exercise physiologist, they're accredited and backed up by a quality industry association. The subject of youth strength training alone could take up multiple podcasts, and there are so many fantastic SNC professionals working in this age bracket. I'm not going to take their thunder, but rather I'm going to highlight the consensus of thought according to the position statement of the ASCA. As a parent myself, I have two children, one is 12 and one is 9. I would think that the most obvious questions would be, is strength training for young children safe? What age can I start weight training? And perhaps a question that is a little overdone but still comes up, will it stunt my growth? So I'm going to get these out of the way first and then go on to some really cool positives of strength training for young people. Once again, due to the amount of information, I'm going to skim over this. And if you want more detail, please download the articles. With direct reference to the ACA position stand, it aims to provide as much clarity and guidance as possible to assist coaches in designing resistance training programs for children and youth at various stages throughout their development. Hence, this document develops several age-related sample programs, proposes age and function-specific progressions in training, and describes the actual first-hand experiences of highly trained athletes who have performed intense resistance training during their youth. This document references 78 peer-reviewed articles. Firstly, how young is too young? If a child is ready to participate in organized and structured sports such as cricket, football, rugby, and even basketball, then they're generally ready to perform a supervised resistance training program. As children typically enter formal school at the age of six years, they may be ready to participate in an organized resistance training program at about this time. However, the actual age will vary from child to child and will be largely based on their capacity to follow clear directions, a really important point. With this, many children at this stage of development may well see the weight area as a big playroom to run around and swing off the equipment and do not have the focused attention span or commitment to apply to training or follow clear directions and therefore are simply not ready for resistance training. Prior to commitments of a resistance training program, the child will be required to be strictly supervised and able to follow clear directions and understand basic safety considerations. And from the above points, One that I like to reinforce is that the child needs to have the focus, attention span, and commitment to apply to training and follow clear directions under strict supervision. I've trained a lot of young athletes, but I can attest that even my son at the age of nine years does not have this level of attention or even interest for regular strength training. So for me, I wouldn't even go there for him. Play, on the other hand, is something that he'd be really into. A second question that comes to mind potentially is how heavy is too heavy? There is an abundance of evidence to suggest that when appropriately performed resistance training, 
It is a safe and effective exercise to be engaged by children and youth. However, it would seem prudent for all children and most youth to avoid the performance of maximal lifts, especially maximal deadlifting. It is the position of the ACA that the following training load intensities and exercise selection strategies be adopted when training children and youth. Level 1, 6 to 9 years of age. Modifications of body weight exercises and light resistance, such as brooms and bands and so forth, and work for relatively high repetitions, around 15 plus reps. Level 2, 9 to 12 years of age, using a 10 to 15 rep range and a maximal loading of approximately 60% of maximum. This is where they would predominantly use simple free weight exercise and machine exercises, which is appropriately sized for the children. Level 3, 12 to 15 years of age, are using a lower rep range of around 8 to 15 reps and increasing that maximal loading to about 70%. And they could be progressively using more free weight exercises, but still avoiding those complex lifts such as clean, snatches and deadlifts. Level 4 is at 15 to 18 years of age and you can be start to looking at that 6 to 15 rep range and using loadings of approximately 80% of maximum. And they might be progressing according to their ability to a more advanced adult type program involving split routines where appropriate and more complex multi-joint movements. And under all circumstances, I think it's imperative that you have an accredited ACA coach in particular, it's so important to get those fundamental movements correct at the start because I know when I get elite athletes at my end who are under 20 or older, they're actually still learning how to do some of those fundamental movements. So I feel the job of a strength coach who's working with young athletes, their job is so important in this space. As I said, this article is massive and I don't want to go too far into it because this podcast would become too long. But another article that I want to briefly go through was titled Weight Resistance Training in Youth Athletes. And this was in this Twitter thread that I was talking about. And this is actually a narrative review, which analyzed the scientific literature regarding the use and efficacy of resistance training regarding the neuromuscular adaptations and how they translate into strength and power gains in youth sport. The object of this paper was to provide recommendations based on the available evidence in the literature on the best practice regarding resistance training in youth sport and with particular reference to maturity status. In this article, one of their ways to identify time periods of individuals' physical growth in relation to skeletal attributes was a concept called peak height velocity. This is the phase where the peak rate of skeletal growth occurs, and peak weight velocity. This is a phase where peak rate of maturation associated with skeletal muscle accretion occurs. With respect to this, the biological changes that occur from childhood through to full maturity directly influences strength and power via multiple mechanisms. Prior to peak height velocity, increases in strength and power via training are suggested to be a result of improved neuromuscular activation. During the stage of maturation, that is pre-peak height velocity, Relatively low concentrations of circulating androgens such as testosterone and growth hormone limit the capacity for skeletal muscle morphological adaptations. A significant phase of growth starts in girls around 9 to 12 years of age and boys a little later at 12 to 14 years of age. And in relation to biological maturation, this equates to approximately one and a half years prior to the peak height velocity. And this period of elevated growth rate lasts until around half to one year post peak height velocity, during which time another large increase in muscular power occurs. In the review, one of their figures gives a great summary of recommendations, and they focus on the pre-peak height velocity period, which is around 10 to 12 years of age, where general strength with an emphasis on functional or foundational movements using a higher rep scheme of around eight to 10 or 12 reps of no specific loadings. Stage two focuses on the period of peak height velocity, and this is around 14 years of age with an emphasis on strength development and an increase in training intensity. Post peak height velocity, this is where high intensity resistance training can commence with traditional and weightlifting movements using high percentage RM loading parameters. Several meta-analysis have actually highlighted that resistance training among youth aged six to 18 years improves muscular strength, power, running speed, kicking velocity, endurance, dynamic balance, flexibility, and general motor performance. These gains make young athletes more resistant to sports-related injuries, 
and resistance training reduces sports-related injuries, both overuse and acute, by up to 66%. In addition to strength, power, and endurance gains, youths who engage in resistance training programs can also improve their general fitness levels, increase confidence in their physical abilities, and experience enhanced mental health and well-being. These findings emphasize that resistance training is also a beneficial activity for non-athletes as well. The effect of resistance training is reported to be moderated by sex and resistance training type. In particular, females have shown to have significantly larger training-induced improvements in sports-specific performance than male athletes, suggesting the trainability of girls may be higher compared with boys. With baseline neuromuscular performance levels lower on average for female athletes, observed gains secondary to resistance training such as improved vertical jump height and lower extremity biomechanics have also been found to be higher among female athletes compared with males. Another meta-analysis on the effects of preventative neuromuscular training intervention on ACL injury risk in young female athletes named strengthening in addition to proximal control exercise and multi-exercise genres as one of the most efficient injury prevention interventions for this at-risk population. In addition to reducing injury risk among young girls by up to 68%, resistance training programs improve skeletal growth, induce a protective neuromuscular spurt, and improves physical self-perception, all of which may increase the likelihood of trained girls remaining physically active in the long term. Overall, I think there's some really great compelling evidence around the positive effects of strength training youth. As always, a sensible and appropriate program under strict supervision is key here. Now it's time to move on to studies that have used BFR in the youth. There aren't a lot, but this will be a quick summary of each to give you a feel of what ages BFR have been used with. The first study was called the effects of practical blood flow training, adolescent lower body strength. The subjects in the study were 15 to 18-year-old boys and girls who were high school students. All of the participants and their legal guardians signed an informed consent document. The purpose of this study was to examine the effects of a practical blood flow restriction training program on lower body strength of high school weightlifters. In the study, 25 students were divided into three groups. It was a six-week study which compared three different variations of a squat. A traditional high low, greater than 65% of 1RM back squat, with three sets of low repetitions. A high load group using a relatively lighter load, that's less than 30% for one set of 30 reps, and then another three sets of 15. And the third group was that same low load using the 75 rep protocol, but using the blood flow restriction. And they used practical blood flow restriction, which is where they used the powerlifting knee wraps. Prior to the beginning of the lifting session, the reps were secured and they remained in place for the duration of the whole squat exercise session, including the rest period. So it was a continuous pressure and they were removed immediately upon its completion. The next two articles looked really promising. However, although their abstract was in English, the rest of the article was in Arabic. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a full English copy of these articles anywhere but for the sake of this section. And Google Translate didn't help me there either. However, I will highlight the ages and any relevant information. The first of these studies was called Effect of Eight Weeks of Aerobic Training with Blood Flow Restriction on Lipid Profile and Body Composition in Obese Adolescent Boys. 32 obese adolescent boys aged 13 to 16 years of age were divided into three groups. It was an eight-week training study where each training session consisted of indoor cycling, where there was five minutes of cycling, four sets, with 65 to 80% of their heart rate max with one minute rest intervals between sets three times a week. That's three times a week using BFR cycling for eight weeks in obese adolescent boys. One of the considerations around BFR use is actually BMI, but there was nothing else I could actually get out of the abstract, unfortunately. And the second of these studies where I couldn't get the full study outline was called Response of Myostatin to Resistance Exercise with and Without Blood Flow Restriction in Immature Male Athletes. It involved 36 adolescent gymnastic boys aged 10 to 14 years of age. So this is our youngest group so far. That's 10 to 14 years of age. The training protocol they used included leg extension, elbow flexion, bicep curls, and also bench press. The last study I'd like to briefly mention is perhaps 
at the extreme end of these age groups on BFR use, and it's called a pediatric case with an unstabilized neck treated with skeletal muscle, electrical stimulation, and katsu training. Quite a mouthful. This was a really interesting case study. And I'm actually going to go through this in a little bit more detail just because I found it fascinating and I really wanted to share it with you. The patient was a two-year and four-month-old boy. That's right, under three years of age. The patient had severe flaccid quadriplegia where he spent most of his life bedridden and was unable to maintain neck stability and barely able to turn over on his own. He required full assistance for both meals and an elimination and was unable to maintain neck stability at the start of this study intervention. Although he could not understand or communicate through language, he was able to express his feelings through facial expressions and he would experience up to 5 to 10 epileptic seizures a day. For me, this is a really different study and as I said, found it fascinating and just follow this a little bit further and I think you'll be amazed at what happened here. In this case study, katsu belts were used and they were wrapped around the uppermost areas of the arms and the legs as we typically would use in BFR. Simultaneously, muscle electrical stimulation belts was also used, but they used a belt electrode system and these were wrapped around the thoracic abdominal areas. I have in previous podcasts spoken about combined therapy of BFR and EMS, Upper arm BFR training was started at a base standard of 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury. And since the patient could not talk, they determined the appropriate pressure based upon the color of the hands, his pulse, and also the child's facial expression. Inflation and deflation was repeated three times. And after some passive range of movement training, the belt electrostimulation system was applied. The intensity was that at which muscular contraction could be confirmed and this was continued for another 10 minutes. In addition, during the training, they carefully observed the patient for any changes in a negative physical state. To report on the changes of 15 weeks of this intervention, a standardized neck stabilization evaluation criteria was used to assess the patient based on recorded videos. Because it's so detailed, if you're really interested, I would urge you to get the paper. Just go through a Google search and you'll be able to get it. After 15 weeks of this intervention, the child had some really good positive improvements. Briefly, they included an increase in shoulder joint range of movement, stronger traction response, improved arm extension, and the neck could be maintained in a midline position. Also in the prone line position, muscle contraction of the lumbar areas was more prominent compared to the start of the treatment. And although his body as a whole was relaxed, he was still able to raise his neck. These findings suggested that muscle tone improved and there was an enhancement in muscle endurance and better muscle control compared to before the start of the training. Now, I didn't intend to review the bulk of the paper, but as I said, I found this absolutely fascinating, hence I wanted to share it with you. And also, it highlights the broad application of using BFI in so many different populations. Away from the academic papers, we're going to move on to something of personal experience. And this last example is one that is very close to my own home, and it actually involves my 11-year-old daughter. She's a cheerleader and pretty active in most sports. After complaining of some reoccurring SIJ pain, as good parents, we decided that we would go to a physio and actually investigate what was going on. And it actually turned out she had a lumbar stress reaction. In the gymnastic and cheerleading world at this age, it's actually quite a common injury. And if let untreated, it may eventually present itself as a stress fracture, which as we could imagine, could pose issues later in life. And thankfully, we know some brilliant physiotherapists who helped to guide us with her recovery. One of the main things we followed was the advice to cease all physical activity for six weeks and put her in a rigid back brace. I'm not the expert here, but these physios have been actually studying the effects of using a back brace in conjunction for the six weeks of physical inactivity, and they've actually found some amazingly positive results. Now, my addition here was the blood flow restriction. In previous episodes, I've spoken about the positive effects of BFR and bone reformation, and also due to the limitations in her level of physical activity, I thought that this may provide something positive here as well. 
Note that during this, she was actually able to walk around and perform normal daily activities, just nothing with physical exertion. During the first six weeks, while she was still in the brace, she would perform passive BFR whilst laying down and watching some TV. So it was really easy to do. She would perform three cycles of four minutes of inflation and two minutes of deflation. And this was twice daily. And at week four, we added in some standing calf raises. That was three by 10 each leg. The pressure I used for my daughter was actually calculated the same way I typically do for an adult. Then as with all users of BFR, my first session, I actually decreased it by 20 mils of mercury. And in my opinion, this helps with understanding the response at a lower pressure. And it's much easier to slowly increase the pressure than to go too high and have the client or the athletes not enjoy the experience. And during the use, I use skin color and capillary refill time as my cross checks to know if the pressure is good. With skin color, it should be a nice dark reddish color. If it's blue or purple, it's too tight. And capillary refill time, this is where on the upper body, it's the palm or the lower body, the VMO, where you would press it and the skin color should turn white. And upon releasing the finger, in around three seconds, it should turn back to that nice dark reddish skin color. After the six week period, when she was out of the brace, we continued for another two weeks where on top of the passive BFR, she performed single leg squats using just a limited range and single leg calf raises using three sets of 10. It's also important to note here, physio also prescribes specific abdominal and flexibility exercise as well, which she did and I felt were really important in her recovery. And before throwing her back into full training, I also put together a graduated return to full training program to ensure that she systematically increased the amount of training load experience on her body. And ultimately, I wanted to make sure that she didn't overdo it. We did a pre and a post scan. Not only did we use a really good physio, but we also consulted an experienced back surgeon just to get the best advice. And at that six week point, she got her second scan and it was all clear. And in fact, the surgeon that we consulted was really amazed at the complete healing of the bone. Now, was it the BFR or was it just that my daughter healed naturally? Great question and we'll never know, but the outcome was a great one with no negative side effects. So for me, I'm gonna take that one. So back to the original question, if we remember, one of the groups were dancers and the other groups were the gymnasts. And I actually asked a few more questions. In particular, they actually do two strength and conditioning sessions a week and overall, with their skill-specific work and their technical work, as you could imagine, they have quite high training loads. And you've got to understand that this is actually still in growing female athletes as well. Other little points here is many of these athletes suffer from foot and ankle stress reactions, which as a result of this, some of them in immobilization boots where they could be wearing them for up to around 2 to 14 weeks at a time. One of their further questions that was asking around the thought about using BFR for these athletes upon returning to full training to accelerate the rehab process. Obviously, one of the thoughts that came to my mind was just some way of being able to control training loads with respect to the elite status of this training group. I think sometimes we need to work out solutions that perhaps we can't control. So for example, if we can't control their training loads, what can we try and positively influence or implement into their training? One idea here, and this is just conceptual, is to think about using BFR, not only to use it to accelerate the rehab process, but potentially use it in a systematic and an ongoing use in their strength sessions twice a week in an ongoing fashion to potentially create maybe a protective mechanism for them and for their bones and for their structures and to actually enable them to get the benefits of strength training without having to put excessive mechanical stress or loadings on their body. And this is a really specific example that would have to be under strict supervision of a coach who has a strong level of training experience with BFR. So where does this leave us with respect to BFR and the youth? For me, like all training interventions, you need to be clear why you are using it. This type of training needs strict supervision and at this age in particular, very important. If you're young and fit, healthy and performing general training, I wouldn't go out and prescribe it. I think there are so many other skills and physical activities that you need them to be exploring before worrying about BFR. 
However, if they have specific injuries or issues they need addressing or have issues relevant to the training group in general, it may be a useful intervention. I'd love to hear from anyone who used BFR in these age groups. I think it could be a good extension to this podcast. So if you have used BFR in young age groups, contact me through my website, which is sportsrehab.com.au or DM me through my Instagram or Twitter page, which is at Chris Cavillio. And we'll get you on to this podcast because I think it's going to be fascinating because I do know a couple of people that have used it in young athletes or young people. And I think understanding on the processes and how they did it may help other people who are in the same situation. That's where I'm going to leave today's podcast. But before I go, a couple of favors from me to you. If you know of someone who would benefit from this episode, please share it. And if you're interested in purchasing your own set of BFR cuffs, please visit my website, which is sportsrehab.com.au. As I mentioned earlier, I can also help you with your training. So contact me via my website or DM me again through my socials, which is at Chris Gavilio. Thanks for listening and remember to keep the pump.